Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Now, if you've been on YouTube for a while, then chances are you've seen those misleading mobile game ads. You probably know the ones that I'm talking about. Actually, let me know in the comments how many of you do know what I'm talking about. I wonder how global these ads are. If you just Google misleading mobile ads, you will find exactly what I mean. Usually they showcase some sort of pin puzzle with lava or acid or a connect the gas puzzle. However, if you then click on those ads, you end up on a game that has absolutely nothing to do with the game shown in those ads. There was even a ruling in the UK that deemed those ads illegal due to being misleading. But anyways, the game idea shown in the ads does seem interesting, so I thought, well, why don't we try to turn those into a proper game? Also, in this video I will talk about one of the most important hidden parts of game development, so make sure you stick around for that. So this is the main design that I was going for. I wanted to be able to pull some pins and have some fluids like lava, water and gas, then combine those with a player character, make some interaction between the particles and end up with a nice puzzle game. So the first thing I began to do was making those fluids. This is the first time that I attempted to do this, so it actually required quite a bit of research. I'm quite pleased with the end result, I actually ended up making a complete tutorial on it on a previous video. Essentially it's tons of tiny spheres and some shader magic to make it look like a liquid. Go watch that video to see how it works, I'm really happy with the final result. So with that I had fluids working and I kept working on the game. Now I was actually going to cut out this next part from the video, but I felt it showcases an important part of game development so I left it in. But before I get to that, let's thank the sponsor that helps these videos exist. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on just about any topic. Explore new skills and improve your current ones at your own pace with unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes for every skill level. Learn skills related to game development, like the basics of computer science. Then learn modeling in Blender by making your very first 3D character. And then learn the basics of animation with all the important principles of squash and stretch, timing and so on. Being a subscription means you don't have to buy each class individually, so for less than $10 a month with the annual subscription you have full access to all the classes you could possibly want. With so many classes available you can learn skills related to game development but also improve on any hobbies you have. For example, learn how to play the guitar, learn electronics with a Arduino and a Raspberry Pi, or learn how to be more productive in life. Join now with the link in the description and for a limited time, the first 1000 people will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Thanks to Skillshare for supporting the video and supporting the channel. So as I was saying, originally I was going to cut out this next part from the video, but then I thought it would be so much better and more transparent if I just left it in. Now if you've seen many of my videos, you might be misled to believing that I'm some sort of genius who makes all of these complex systems perfectly without any errors, but that's definitely not reality. The reality is that, as with anything, making games and programming is all about learning and learning is all about making mistakes. The final polished videos that you see are after I've done all of my mistakes and after I spent a considerable amount of time in research and preparation. Actually, one comment that I sometimes get which is a bit frustrating is when people say that I go too fast in a certain video and they can't follow. My response to that is to use the pause button and take your time, learn at your own pace and just focus on learning. But sometimes people get upset with that reply as if it's something they're not supposed to do. Like for some reason they think they should be able to learn absolutely everything about a particular system in exactly the length of the video. So that's the distorted reality that a final polished video creates. When you see a 20 minute tutorial, it absolutely did not take me 20 minutes to learn how to do that. Those final 20 minutes equate to hours or even days of research and preparation, not to mention my 20 years of programming experience. The learning progress takes time and mistakes are absolutely part of it. I usually cut mistakes out of the videos because, well, I want to make sure that I'm teaching the correct way rather than leading you down a wrong path, but those mistakes are not really mistakes, just attempts that didn't exactly work out. Those do exist and are absolutely normal and part of the process. Now specifically what happened here was I was trying to solve one particular limitation of the liquid system that I showcased in the previous video. In that system, it uses a shader to apply a visual to the particles and then I have a different material for each liquid type. However, the shader is applied to all the particles on screen, so I cannot have water particles and lava particles in the same scene at once. For this design, I absolutely needed multiple particle types active at once, so I had to solve that. After thinking for a bit, I came up with an approach that could work, so I thought I could tint the particles in a specific color and then in my shader use those colors essentially as masks. So the shader would identify the red particles and make them look like lava, then identify the blue particles and make them look like water. It sounds like it should work. And it probably does work, however I'm not a shader expert, it's one of the areas I don't have a lot of experience in. 
So I had no clue how do I mask out a specific color out of an image. I mean, doing that through code is very simple. I just go through every pixel, check if it's close enough to the pixel color that I want to match, and if so, I keep the value, if not, I discard it. I can easily think of that logic, but I couldn't really apply it with a shader. So I tried doing it, tried doing a bunch of math to isolate a specific color, I attempted subtracting the mask from the original colors and inverting the results, I tried using a step node, I thought maybe I could use multiplication or maybe the module node, so I spent quite a while going through this, trying all the possible scenarios and failing every single time. Not a single one of my attempted methods worked. Also, it doesn't really help that I was trying to get this working at night after a 14 hour workday. So that's a quick tip for you, make sure you take your rest seriously. A tired brain will really just make tons of mistakes. It's much better to rest and come back the next day. So that's exactly what I did. And in the end, after destroying my brain for quite a while, I opted to go with a simpler, different approach. I made a separate camera for each liquid type and used the same method as previously. Obviously, this has a pretty steep performance cost, having all of these cameras and render textures at once, but it did work. So that's the part that normally I would cut from my videos and skip to this point, but this time I felt it was important that I left it in. Trying different approaches and failing until you find the one that works is absolutely part of the process. Whenever you watch one of my videos, I want you to know that I don't come up with all of this magically, it all takes tons of time and lots of trial and error. And by the way, if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing and hitting the like button. It really helps out the channel. So with that, I had my multiple liquids working. Next up, I wanted to make some interactions between them. For example, I wanted to turn lava plus water into stone. In terms of logic, that task was surprisingly easy. The first thing was I need to know the type of each particle. And for that, I made a scriptable object to hold the type. These are super useful and I've used them in lots of games. In this case, I didn't even need any data, just having the object for each type was more than enough. Then I made a script that has a field to store the type and attach that script to every particle. And with that, now I know which particle is which. So I made another simple script, this one listens to collisions, and when a collision happens, it checks the type of the particles involved in collision. If one of them is water and the other one is lava, then I simply convert both those particles into stone. As I mentioned previously, the visual is handled by different cameras, so changing the visual is literally just changing the layer in the particle and change the type stored in that script. And that's it, super simple interaction between the particles, and now when lava touched water, it would turn into stone. The one issue is that it didn't really become as interesting as I would like. Essentially, it would make a single layer of stone with lava beneath and water on top. Which I guess is realistic, but it doesn't really look too good. As a solution, I thought, well, why don't I try to add some random jumping force to my lava particles? It would seem like the lava is bubbling, which does make sense, and having them bubble up would shift the particles around and clear some space so that more lava could turn into stone. Well, I kind of messed up on the values I used and accidentally created a lava shower. Not exactly what I was going for, but the idea worked. So I tweaked the values a bit and the lava particles randomly jumped up, which slightly made them get into more contact with water and turn into more stone. However, that was still not great, so I also added some simple logic to make the stone go into the bottom. Essentially, if there's a collision, it checks if one is stone and the other one is lava, then it checks if the lava is under the stone, and if so, they essentially swap positions. Then just for testing and also for fun, I made a quick fountain script, so it just spawns particles so I can keep spawning more water to make sure that everything works. Alright, so with that, it was time to move on from the particles. Next up was handling the pins. I wanted to be able to click and push or pull a certain pin. And it also needed to have some limits to how much it can move. First, for handling the click, it's pretty simple. Just add a sprite for the pin head and implement eye pointer down and eye pointer up. However, it's actually not that simple. I actually forgot that the pointer events were supposedly only meant to work with the UI. Usually, for world objects, you would use the mono behavior on mouse down. However, if you use a different raycaster, in this case the physics raycaster, they also work with game objects. So that was interesting, I went down a somewhat wrong path and learned something new. And with that, I could now click on the pins. Then it was time to move the pin alongside the axis. This was another slightly tricky thing. Math is definitely not my strong point, so this took some googling. Essentially, I wanted to find out the closest point along the axis of the pin. With that, thankfully, I found a great post on Stack Overflow, applied it to the pins, and it worked perfectly. And with that, I had the ability to click and drag pins along its axes. Then for the limits, for the minimum, it stores the starting position and collates the dot product between that and the desired new position. If it's going past the starting position, then simply don't move. And for the maximum, it's also simple. Collate the distance between the start and new position. If it's too far, then snap it back. 
And that's it, another very simple mechanic implemented. I can click and drag to move any pin and I can define how far I want it to move. Just with this, if you put them together, you already have some mechanics that work very well with one another. So by this point, the liquid portion of the game was working well, so next up was handling the tubes for the gas. I wanted a gas container with a tube that I could drag, and if I connect it to another container, then the gas should flow there. First, it was handling the custom shape of the pipe, I wanted it to connect from the entry to the exit. For that, I made a simple custom mesh, essentially just take these four points and generate a quad. It's simple and works great. I covered meshes in detail in another video if you want to learn more. And then after that was actually the point when I started live streaming the development. These live streams are not really planned ahead of time, so if you want to be notified when they happen, then make sure you hit the bell icon. Oh, and by the way, these characters you see at the bottom, that was a fun overlay that I used during the live stream. It shows the characters of the people in chat as well as some messages. So make sure you join the next live stream to see yourself on screen. I also previously made tutorials for the transparent TNT window as well as the chat bubble. So the first task on the live stream was adding a health system to the player. Again, I reused the health system which was actually made on the very first video on this channel over three years ago. Just made a health system and a health bar from my utilities. Then in order to apply damage, I wanted to know when the lava touched the player. Since I already set up all the liquid types using scriptable objects, this was very easy. Just make the player a trigger collider so it doesn't block liquids and listen to those collisions. If it's lava, deal damage. Very simple logic and worked perfectly. Next up, handling the coins. Also very simple. These are exactly the same as the liquid particles, except they don't have a special shader on top. Just a simple coin sprite. The goal is for the player to win when they touch these coins. So then getting back into the pipes. First handling the logic for clicking and dragging. Again, using pointer events and making it follow the mouse position. Then I made a separate connector. And when the mouse is released, it checks if there's a connector nearby. If so, it gets connect. It snaps into the new position and rotation. Also added some extra logic to make sure you can't drag the pipes too far. With that, they were connected. Then to make them flow was really just adding colliders. There's a collider on the entry and the exit. And when a connection happens, those two are disabled and two other colliders are created on the top and bottom. And with this, it allows the particles to flow. It works for liquids and also works for gas. For another mechanic, I implemented player death. And for the death type, I used water, essentially having the player drown. So for that I placed a collider at the height of the head, then I made a simple script to listen to water collision. If there's water touching the head then it counts up a value, and if it reaches above a certain value then the player simply drowns. Again, all very basic logic, easy to implement and adds yet another mechanic into the game. Then I made pretty much exactly the same thing, except instead of drowning it's lack of oxygen. There's a timer constantly counting down and a bar showing the oxygen level. Every time the oxygen gas particle touches the character's face, it raises that bar. If it gets down to zero, the player dies. If it goes up, the player survives. So with this, I could already make tons of unique designs based on gas pipes and liquids. And that was the last task that I made during the live stream. It was two hours, which was surprisingly very productive. Again, make sure you hit the bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I go live. So after all that, it was time to make some levels using all of these mechanics. I built a total of 5 levels, all of them showcasing the various mechanics. Now I'm not much of a puzzle game designer myself, but it was fun to design scenarios that showcase interesting interactions between the particles. I designed those levels, then just polish it all up, and here's the final result. Alright, so starting off over here on a very simple main menu, just hit on play, and yep, here is the very first level. So it's got water, lava, and some gold. The objective is to get the gold. So one of the interactions that I added was that if the coins touch the lava, they get destroyed. So if I just pump the coins right away, and nope, they don't actually reach the player, they hit the lava and they get destroyed. So that's not the solution. So here the goal is essentially to drop the water on the lava. So that creates some stone. And then when there's enough stone, essentially I can pass in the coins and they slide down. They go through an invisible wall and they hit the player and you win. All right, very simple level. Then up here on level two, the goal on this one is to get the stone into the pit. So first I need to convert these into stone. So pretty much just drag a bunch of water on there. And yep, there's the interaction. So as soon as water touches lava, it turns into stone and then the stone gets filled down into the bottom. Now here, obviously tricky thing is that if I push it all away, then a bunch of lava goes in and damages the player. So I gotta be careful with that. I gotta essentially put it just little one by one.
and yep, when enough stone gets on the pit, then you win. Now up here on level 3, this turn showcases the gas pipes. So if I connect the gas straight into the player, then all of this toxic gas goes towards the player. As soon as it touches the player, it starts damaging it. And yep, after a while, there you go, you lose. So the goal here is to eliminate the zombie. So instead of connecting to the player, just connect into the zombie. And yep, you win. And now on this one, this one's really interesting. So the goal, save the knight and dump the water. So right away the knight is being drowned, so he's under the water and constantly losing health. So obviously I gotta connect the pipe in order to get the water to drain. And there you go, as soon as the water goes underneath the head area, then the knight is now no longer drowning. However, now I can't dump the water just like this, since this is a gas, so if I just connect these, then nope, doesn't quite work out. So instead, just open up that valve, and now the gas is gonna flow away, and with this, and now the water flows down there. And when enough water gets dumped... Yep, there you go, we've got a level win. And on the final level, also very interesting. So the player is in there, and he's in need of oxygen. And right away, there's oxygen down here and water in here. If I just try to go, nope, doesn't quite go, the water puts pressure on the oxygen, and nothing actually happens. So now the poor player is essentially gonna lose his oxygen. So instead, the solution to this one is first dump the water. So just connect the pipe and let the water flow. Then connect the oxygen. And now here is the tricky thing. If I open the whole thing, then the oxygen is gonna leave through there. So that's not quite gonna work out. Only a bunch of them go in there. So instead, the solution is just to open up just a tiny bit, just to be able to get exactly on there and not waste any oxygen. And there you go, when there's enough oxygen in there, then the player is breathing it, and yep, he saved. Alright, so there it is, those are five interesting levels that I made using these mechanics. You can download the complete project files from the website, or play the game for yourself through the Steam app. It's a simple design, but it works quite well. This was a great mini game to make, I hope you enjoyed watching this making of video. And thank you to everyone who joined me on the live stream. If you want to be notified of new videos or whenever I go live, then make sure you hit the bell icon. Don't forget to check out Skillshare through the link in the description and start learning a new skill today. If you found this video helpful, consider liking and subscribing. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. Post any questions or have any comments and I'll see you next time.